everybody. Welcome to the Jeff Rubin, Jeff Rubin Show. I am Jeff Rubin, and today on the Skype on the phone, I am joined by video game lawyer Ryan Morrison. Welcome to the show, Ryan. Hello, and thank you for having me. Uh, help me out here, Ryan. Video game lawyer. How do I explain this to people? What does that mean? Sure. So there's really no things. There's no such thing as video game law. It's more a bunch of area of law uh, through the context of video games. So it's intellectual property, trademarks, copyrights, that kind of thing. It's a lot of contract law. It's a lot of corporate law. But it's all just how those things apply to video games. So when I'm negotiating a contract against a quote unquote normal entertainment attorney, I can get most things I want because they've never heard of them. Like all the Twitch rights and the YouTube streaming rights and things like that. And uh, it, it's just very beneficial to work with an attorney who understands your industry when you're trying to protect yourself. And so just to be clear, you are a real lawyer. You have a law degree. <laughs> That's correct. And you also presumably like video games. Like you, it's, or, I mean, I guess, do you? <clears throat> yeah. So I grew up a, a huge nerd and, uh, you know, big fan of your show on, on College Humor as well. Oh, and, thanks so much. <laughs> no problem. You were a and, huge nerd. Yeah, right. So I, I grew up into games and, and grew up into all that. Uh, I had just graduated law school. I'm still a young attorney. And I was uh, big into the Reddit scene, meaning I really just was lurking and reading a bunch of stuff on Reddit. There was a bunch of people getting uh, gone after by Candy Crush or King, more accurately, the company that makes Candy Crush. They were trying to trademark the word candy and trademark the word saga individually, just as those words. And they were holding up a lot of companies. And a lot of people were on Reddit, small-time studios. Uh, Banner Saga was famously involved, although they were not a client I worked with, but they're the ones that were making the headlines. There was a lot of smaller studios that were just being held up by this or being shut down over this. And, and I was sitting there saying, you know, this really sucks. Someone should help them. And then I kind of realized I could. <laughs> So King was trying to trademark the word candy and the word saga just in any video game context. Is exactly. Funny? And then we'll there was games that had been around remember. earlier, but they were basically saying it doesn't matter. We're going to shut you down. We're more popular. They even went a little more underhanded than that by going and, and buying a, an abandoned games trademark from many years earlier called, I believe, Candy Crusher. It's been a while. And they said, well, now we own this trademark, so we have the earliest rights to candy in, in video games. We're going to shut everyone else down. So – Help me understand, because, you know, you read about things like this on the internet, and you're like, oh, that's bullshit, I'm so mad. But, you know, I'm, I am not a lawyer, as the saying goes, so I, I don't actually understand what the ins and outs of what makes it bullshit, right? I know that's wrong. Sure. That, 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 I know no, that, totally, that, so that, that's and that's wrong. important to keep in mind, because most of the time, it's nowhere near as bad as it sounds. Right. Uh, for the, since that Candy Crush thing, I, 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 that's when I kind of took on the moniker Video Game Attorney and ran with it. Uh, I get a lot of emails and messages and, and texts and private messages saying, I, I read that this company is trying to trademark this word. Can you believe it? We have to stop them. And 99 times out of 100, it's nowhere near as bad as it sounds. Can King do this? Like what what makes them think they are able to do this and what makes you think you are able to stop them? Sure. So trademarks are broken up into classes of goods. So when a lot of times when you hear these things, it's nowhere near as bad as it sounds. For example, Apple brand computers. If you had never heard of the company Apple, but you read a headline, this company's trying to trademark the word Apple, most people would go crazy over that. The problem is Apple brand computers are fine. It only becomes ridiculous when it's a descriptive turn. So when they're trying to do Apple brand apples or Apple brand food products, that wouldn't be okay. So here we had King trying to trademark candy in video games, or, or I, I mean the Saga one was a little more egregious, where Saga's been around in video games forever. Uh, you know, if you're going to own that term and then own that genre of game, it, it becomes very dangerous. And you can, you in fact have to enforce your trademark or you lose it. So people who say, oh, we're just getting this trademark to protect ourselves, but we're not going to take anyone else down. That's not true. You have to. So that, that's disingenuous every time. Uh, they might not realize it's disingenuous, but, you know, legally speaking, it certainly is. So they can do it in the sense that they just have to get approved by a government agent. These government agents are mostly wonderful people. I deal with them every day and truly, you know, it's it's not like the DMV. These guys actually care about their job. They really try to do a good job and, and they're very responsive and, and great. They're the best government a in agency around, but they screw up sometimes. Everyone does. And here, you know, that's one of the more famous times when they screwed up, I think. Uh, granting saga in video games is, is a little silly to me. And, you know, what I can do to stop them, so there's a couple things. The first one is I can help someone else oppose the trademark, which is after a trademark gets approved, there's a 30-day opposition period where you can, the, anyone in the public who feels this trademark's going to hurt them can say, hey, guys, I oppose this, here's why, and now, you know, look at it again. 
So that's very common. Then there's also if, if King is sending out cease and desist, I can help those people getting those cease and desist for free. And that's a big, you know, I still have a standing offer on Reddit where if you get a frivolous cease and desist, I'm, I'm happy to help you completely pro bono. And what made you put that offer up? Was it seeing this King thing? It's because I grew up a nerd and I really just do enjoy the game scene and I'm not talented enough to make them. So if I can help people with honestly very minimal effort a lot of times uh, save their company, I'm happy to do it. And then, of course, it's not, you know, I, I scream pro bono all, all over and I'm, I'm happy to help people all the time if they're getting bullied. But, you know, those companies need their own trademarks, too. Trademarks aren't bad. They're just misused sometimes. And that's when I charge and keep the lights on here. But at the end of the day, I'm a nerd and I'm happy driving a Kia and eating Taco Bell. I don't need a mansion. I mean, it's kind of funny because, you know, when you talk about being a nerd, part of that is just like not liking bullies. And it sounds like right. you're stopping people from getting bullied. And it, it is true that like sometimes you need a lawyer just to like write a let. Like you don't need a lawyer to like go to court and litigate for you. You're just like what exactly. is the official way to reply to this letter, right? Just knowing what to say to Apple. So, let it, you know, if you're in the, in the Apple App Store and you, you have an app and you get a takedown from someone else – if you say three wrong words in that response, all of a sudden Apple takes that as an admission of guilt and takes you down forever. So it's just better to have me or, or another attorney answer for you. And it, again, sometimes it's just minimal effort where clearly this, this is not something takedown worthy. Fix this. And Apple says, OK, and that's it. And I just know the process better. I can streamline it better. And yeah, no one likes to get a scary letter from a, a law firm. <laughs> did you let's take a step back for a sec did you know when you went to law school that this was the field you would want to get into no zero percent so i i actually uh went to law school to litigate criminal law and now i don't litigate or do criminal law so it's it's a uh, quite a different term i didn't know what a trademark was when i went to law school i mean i of course heard the term but i wouldn't have been able to tell you the difference between a trademark and copyright and now that's all i deal in every day so it's it's very strange uh, Gregory Boyd, a little shout out to him, is one of the greatest game attorneys in the world and happened to just be teaching an hour course at my law school. We were the only law school I'm aware of. Maybe NYU did also, but w the only one I'm aware of that uh, had a video game anything. What law school did you go to? I'm not sure you mentioned uh, that. New York Law School, sorry. So it, everyone assumes that's NYU, which I let them assume. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I went to Penn State, and I've definitely let some people assume that was uh, Penn, so yeah. I, I understand. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's uh, and it really is a great school. New York Law School had one of the best IP departments around, which is intellectual property, which again, I did not go for, but I really just lucked out into. It's some of the, uh, you know, still the professors are some of the most world-renowned academics on the subject, and he had worked with this guy, Gregory Boyd, had worked with a lot of game studios and kind of made me realize, oh, you know, that that's a cool thing. But at that time and very truly, I, I was I looked at that as, you know, becoming the next Ari Gold talent agent. Like, sure, it's a thing, but no, one, you know, he does that. No one else is going to be able to pull that off. And uh, the more I looked into it, I, I got a job at a video game studio in law school. I helped them with their marketing and I, I did. I taught myself trademarks and helped them with some of that stuff because they were having issues and here we are. <laughs> so in terms of like stuff you did above and beyond law school to prepare to work in video games, it sounds like it, it was sort of a learning on the job thing. You sort of figured out what you need to figure out to work at this specific role and then you ex took it from there. Is that right? Yeah. So it was very self-taught. So as, as great as Gregory Boyd was, he was, you know, a, a running a huge law firm and we're not running it, but he's running his department at a huge law firm and he was only teaching an hour course. So he would absolutely help me out with questions or a template or anything I needed really. But I didn't want to annoy the hell out of him. And I also just wanted to really know this stuff. So the USPTO's website, which is where you apply for trademarks, has a million YouTube uh, tutorial videos and they have uh, just uh, endless documents on how to do things. And all I did was sit there and self-teach myself. And also anecdotally, I realized we didn't like calling our own attorney at that law firm because he would charge for every phone call. He would charge for every email. Uh, most attorneys in most law firms, and by most, I mean every single one I know of besides myself and one or two others, charges just for any interaction you have with them based out of your retainer. And it, it makes a relationship where it's very hostile. You want to have a quick phone call. You're afraid to ask things. And I really wanted to shut that down and do things differently with these game studios. And I do think I have much more of a familial feel with them where, where when they launch their, their games, I'm tweeting them out and I'm playing them, giving feedback. Uh, I go to their launch parties. You know, we're, we're, 
yes, of course, I charge them and there's an invoice and there's a business relationship, but I also really try to have a friendly relationship with most of them too. So how do you charge them? How does it work from a business perspective if you're not doing the thing that most law firms do? Sure. So, you know, it's it's a lot of uh, flat fees because I want you to know what you're paying for when you go in. I don't like to do this the hourly and the surprise bill at the end of the month. So I have a flat rate for trademarks. I have a flat rate for your contractor agreement. Uh, things like that. And, and yes, those things fluctuate depending on the difficulty of them or, or how involved you want to get with things. But there's a lot of stuff you need. And, and I, you know, there's a checklist most game studios need to go from hobbyist to professional. And that checklist, I charge for everything on that checklist. But I'm very upfront about it. We go over why it's important and, we, and it, I try to make it as cheap as possible. So that is most of your clients then is like games, you know, uh, maybe hobbyist game makers trying to go legit, trying to make a real product, sell it and make money off of it, right? Is that, is, is that the thing you're mostly doing? I would say the first year, yes. So when this Candy Crush stuff happened and, and how it, exp- it, it, I mean, it really exploded. I got 10,000 Twitter followers overnight and, and somebody drew me that superhero logo. That's my Twitter avatar. You know, it was incredible. It was unreal. So for the first year, yes, it was very much that. Uh, still to this day, I do it. I try to do it weekly. It's not quite that uh, AMA, which is a, a question and answer series on the game developer subreddit where these hobbyists can, or even mid-level developers can come in and ask questions. Nowadays, I'm very lucky uh, to have kind of, you know, risen the ranks in the, in the industry where, of course, I'm not one of the most experienced oldest attorneys in it, but I do think I'm in the upper echelon of client base. Uh, if you can name a client I've worked for with or against them at this point, uh, normally ag- against the ones you would name off the top of your head, like Blizzard, <laughs> because Blizzard is more a publisher at this Not even. That's unfair. They're a developer. But you know what I mean? I, th- those AAA studios, I'm usually the one representing the artists getting the job there and negotiating their contract for them, things like that. Right. So I'm a cool video game developer. I got this hip, cool, fun idea. I'm going to make a game out of it. Like, why do I need a lawyer? What's the worst that can happen? Sure. So there's a, there, the biggest thing I see, there's two huge things that I see happen besides the scary headlines that we can get into after. The first one is people on, online nowadays is that a lot of, how a lot of these relationships form. They'll, they'll go on Reddit or another forum or wherever and they'll say, hey, I have this cool ga- game idea. I can program really well, but I need someone to do art. An artist will pop up and say, hey, I can do art. Uh, you know, Pay me $10,000. I'll do all the art for your game. Cool. Deal. Everybody's happy. The problem is, if you don't have a proper contract written by someone who knows what they're talking about, the intellectual property that that artist creates stays with that artist. So they aren't selling you that art. They're selling you a license to use that art. That license is revocable. They can then hold your game hostage after you launch if it does well. And you know a plethora of other problems that can occur there. With any relationship, you just want the contract there. You want to understand what's expected, what's the approval process. What if you pay them and the art sucks? Do you have to still pay them? What if you pay them and they only do half the work? Do you still would you pay them half? So all that stuff needs to be written into the contract. And I promise you, most, especially for the first year, I do think more people are taking precautions now ahead of time. But for the first year, people were coming to me with everything already on fire. They would say, "I hired this artist. I paid him right. X amount of money, and and now I can't release my game because uh, they'll just send a DMCA takedown." On the flip side, they do revenue share, which no one has ever written properly without an attorney. I, I really believe that. Uh, when you're saying, I'll give you 3% of company profits, well, is that after taxes or before? Is that after expenses? Is it 3% of company profits or the game that they worked on only? And you, ha- you really need to specify that stuff. Or, or even more dangerously, they'll give them equity, which is actual ownership. So just all those things are probably things you hadn't thought of. And it's all things that you just should have a conversation with an attorney before you move forward on. The other major problem in a different area is, let's say a group of friends, let's say you're, you're a great uh, programmer and your buddy's a great artist and you guys have been best friends since you're five years old. Cool. We're going to make a game together. This is going to be so fun. You never make a contract. You're treated as a partnership. That means you can both bind each other to agreements. All of a sudden, maybe one of you meets someone and wants to move away halfway across the world because you're in love. You just lose interest or the game's not selling well, so you have to go get a full-time job, but the other one doesn't want it yet. Well, what happens to all that intellectual property? What happens to the partnership? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I, I really, truly believe a good contract will save friendships. It makes it so there's no argument. You guys just say, oh, boom, here, we already agreed to this. How does your gamer knowledge and how does your knowledge of video games help inform that work? Because what you're describing, you know, like these are standard legal issues that presumably other people face in other industries. I don't know anything about anything except video games, so I don't know what that would look like. But presumably these like contract law, like there are contract lawyers. Like what is, what is you being a gamer? How does that help you? Uh, do game contract law. 
Sure. So the first, the the benefit every client I've ever worked with, I think, tells me is that when it, when they had worked with attorneys in the past, they were charged an hour to explain to that attorney what Steam is. So just the fact that I, I really understand the game industry and I really understand the product and I know all the back end stuff really lets me just have a quicker conversation with you and understand your product. What helps us legally is so, for example, when we're doing a revenue share split, Unity or Unreal Engine, they all take money out of the product. They all they all have licensing fees, which of course they should. But those kind of licensing fees might not be worked into a net revenue agreement by an attorney who's never heard of Unity, who doesn't understand that you need to look at those licensing deals. They don't understand the huge difference between an App Store release and a Steam release or a console release or what a dev kit is. Uh, they, they just don't understand the different hardwares that you might be releasing on. They'll never try to secure proper streaming rights if you're doing a licensing deal. What about modding when, with your terms of service and your EULA? Are people going to be able to do whatever they want with a mod? Can they charge for the mods? So all those kind of things are, are things that I personally see most other attorneys completely skip over. Now, of course, there's more and more game attorneys every day, and there's a lot of attorneys who do understand the game scene. So I'm not pretending I'm the only one who understands this stuff. But I do think it's important to work with someone who does understand this stuff. At some point in, in your career, have you come across a lawyer who was hilariously uninformed about games, but, you know, was still litigating about them in court in some way? And let me just quickly say, that's okay to not know everything about video <laughs> games. You know, people people got no different things. People have different interests. But at some point, have you met a lawyer who just made some ridiculous argument that anyone uh, who doesn't, not necessarily even lawyers, but just people who play video games would immediately be able to pick apart? Oh, absolutely. So the the there's two that jumped to mind. The first was one of my earliest trademark oppositions was against another attorney who kept screaming uh, Final Fantasy IV was exactly the same as electronic chess. And there's no difference between electronic chess or any other video game in the world. No, wait. Japanese <laughs> Final Fantasy IV? Like the one that wasn't even released here? <laughs> Excellent question. And actually, yes, those are the screenshots we were using. Why? I, is it, I don't that, know how much you can talk about more, specific cases, but like, why were you talking about Final Fantasy IV? Was yeah, it, that I probably shouldn't even get into. It's, it, I, it, I was not working with anybody involved with Final Fantasy. We were using it to show the difference in the genre, and he was saying there is no such thing as a genre in video games. He admitted there were genres in music. He admitted there were genres in TV. He said all video games were basically just electronic chess. Awesome. I love that story. Yeah. yeah. And then the other one uh, was I had an attorney really fighting with me over merchandising rights in the contract. So we were giving an IP to a studio in exchange for X and we wanted to control X. He said, I'll give you the streaming rights and I'll give you the, the licensing rights for uh, online viewership, but we have to get all T-shirt rights. So I said, fine. You know, I mean, of course, I didn't say it like that. I acted totally heartbroken, but fine, you can have all the t-shirt rights you want, because no one's ever bought a licensed t-shirt before, I don't think. I, I'm, I'm an IP attorney, and I have, I'm have i currently wearing an unlicensed Skyrim t-shirt. So it's just, yeah, okay, you can have the t-shirts, and we'll take all the Twitch and YouTube money. So it does, it is, an, it is an advantage, in a way. Yeah, big time. And you just know what buttons to push. You know what is, quote-unquote, industry standard. And if you don't know any... I couldn't go in and negotiate a movie deal. I, I just don't know what you need to push back on and what you shouldn't push back on. I would absolutely call in co-counsel on that. But in the video game industry, I know what is important to the developers. I know what everyone's upset they don't have in a year. And that kind of experience, even though I've been doing this a, a short amount of time, I I can really go against some of the best of them, I think, because this industry is, it's a young industry itself. You know, these things didn't right. exist five years ago. You seem to have taken on this role of being a, a good guy in the video game community. You're doing this free work to help people fight these frivolous lawsuits, and I think you, you've made yourself available to answer questions for free. You're you're a, a good guy in the community. Is there a, a someone on the other side? Is there like a black hat nerdy game lawyer? Like these lawyers that are starting frivolous lawsuits, are they also gamers? Because it's hard for me to imagine that gamers could be that uncool. Well, so I won't name a name, but he'll know who he is if he listens to this, which will just make me feel good, and I'll be sure to tweet it in their direction. Uh, there, There's not necessarily the antithesis that they – because the, the benefit I have is I'm literally just here. If, you're get, if you get bullied, I'm happy to help you. The bullies all kind of have their own attorneys for many years. Uh, so they, I get a lot of you know the bad guy on the other side coming after various clients from different angles. But there was one attorney who sent such an egregious cease and desist – to one of my favorite clients, who I, I also just can't name. But that attorney, uh, they, they sent this whole thing, and I literally just sent them back a letter saying, I looked at your Twitter, how dare you act like you enjoy the game industry when you're sending out things like this, when you're trying to shut down such a creative, unique game based on your, your client's crappy match-three game, 
And it's not Candy Crush. It was another Match 3 game. But those are usually the biggest bullies. Uh, and I sent him such like a shame, shame, I know your name letter. Uh, I sent him a screenshot of one of the tweets he sent about how that he, you know, he's so excited for what's coming out from my client a year ago. So, and he literally removed himself from the case and had another attorney come in. I love it. I love it. So you do have like a Mr. Glass out there. Like, yeah, like yeah. He, your, he, your dark side. Yeah. I mean, Jack Thompson is the one everyone brings up, but that was a little before oh, right, my time. Right. But Jack Thompson obviously did. He was, he sort of, I can't even remember, but he was sort of crusading against violent video games right. in, in a real, in a way that, I mean, obviously I'm biased because I really like video games, but just like had no merit whatsoever. You well, know? I mean, he got this bard. He was frothing at the mouth. He was a complete lunatic. Right. He literally got this bard eventually. Yeah. He um, was, there was but nothing. he doesn't like video games, you know? Like, obviously, <laughs> he, like, he didn't go... I mean, maybe he did. Maybe he, like, went home and, like, turned out the lights and drew the curtains and played Grand Theft Auto, oh, you know? Oh, you know, he probably did. He was doing research for the case and he got addicted to the missions. <laughs> But there is there is some uh, there there's three law firms who very much know who they are who are the bullies of the game industry. Do you ever meet uh, like you know traditional lawyers who dismiss your work and they're like, oh, vi- child stuff, video games? Constantly, every day. I might. Avatar is a superhero cartoon drawing. I hand. It's on my business card. If I go to a lot of events that are not game themed, I would get laughed out of the room. But it's it's fine. I mean, I I'm. Ha- yeah, I'm. I'm always going to be laughed at like that because not only did I start out on my own as a solo attorney, and and did I start with the pro bono work and with helping the, the smaller game devs, uh, you know, a lot of attorneys just don't take that stuff seriously. If you don't do 15 years at big law like they did, it's just not necessary anymore. It's a different world. So I like that they underestimate me, and they underestimate me for all those reasons: where I went to school, where I grew up, et cetera, et cetera. So fine, you can. Laugh all the way to my client winning. I mean, don't lawyers speak this language? Not to stereotype, but don't lawyers understand money and see like what an industry like video games are? And just in the same way that like movie lawyer, like no one would laugh at you for being a movie lawyer at this point. That's like obviously a thing. Like clearly the video game industry is just as big and needs its own lawyers, doesn't it? So there's two answers to that. The first is lawyers absolutely want money, but they absolutely are also hams. And it sounds cooler to them at their cocktail parties to say, oh, I'm a movie attorney rather than I'm a video game attorney. So they love that. They love just saying who their clients are and name dropping when they shouldn't and things like that. The other flip side is is they really refuse to believe games are not a fad. Most, most people over 45 refuse to believe games are not a fad. I represent you know, the top five esports players in the world, and they still get laughed at when they go into a business event, but they're earning more than everyone in that room. It, it's not something taken seriously yet, but it's absolutely something that's getting more serious, getting taken more seriously. Every day I get five emails from, you know, new game attorneys who just got sworn in, who are starting their own solo shop, saying, you know, I can't wait to, to join you in the, in the ranks here. And that's great, you know, more power to them, but it's it's becoming a very competitive industry because there are a lot of attorneys realizing the money here. And then where the traditional lawyer money is, is where those, you know, bullying, for lack of a better word, law firms are that that realize the the cease and desist being masked out are how you make quick money. And that's where you can scare a developer into paying 10 grand. Uh, and, and I don't want to make cease and desist seem like a bad thing. There, there's a lot of a lot of instances where someone is ripping off your idea or is stealing your stuff. I personally send out cease and desist. There's nothing wrong with it. What's wrong with it is when you are doing something completely overreaching or acting like you own a genre or, or just own a, a, a word that's so commonly used. It's that's when it becomes not OK. You mentioned that you started as a solo lawyer, and I don't really know much about, I know more about video games, let's say, than the (laughs) traditional path of a lawyer and how one becomes one and how one starts their own practice. So first of all, right now, you work out of your own practice. Am I using the terminology correctly here? Sure, yeah, basically. And I'm about to actually uh, bring in a partner and a couple of other attorneys, so so things are going well. Uh, How how did that get started? Talk about how you went from being a solo lawyer to starting your own practice. Even if that doesn't touch on video games, it's just something I don't know anything about. Sure, so I mean... it, quite literally, when I graduated, I got sworn in. It takes it's months and months in the process, and the whole time I was just you know learning and, and preparing for, you know, it had been a pipe dream to start my own thing. I, I, I had another job. I was about to start that job. I had been working for another attorney, and you know, I I had done plenty. But then this Candy Crush stuff happened, and that's when I sent the email saying, you know, I've been a lawyer eight days, but I'll help you for free. And they said, okay, sure, let's go. And that's when I decided to quit my other job and really just roll with this and see what happened. And, I, I, you know, luckily it turned into something. When we got to the point where – so, I mean, I, I'm leaving for Amsterdam tomorrow. I get – not you know, I go all over to speak about the law or to go meet clients or, or potential clients. 
And it's really blossomed into this, this huge thing where there is that mid-level of game studios who can't afford the traditional big law, law firms, but they still need protection. They're making a lot of money, potentially. Uh, and I really fit that, that niche area pretty well. And it's just grown so quickly where if you Google anything related to this stuff, I'm the top five results. So that means I get a lot of consultations and I get a lot of clients out of it. It's, it's all turned into great marketing, even if that wasn't it truly that wasn't the original intent. So this other attorney who I, I can't say his name quite yet, uh, but he's been litigating for a long time. He's an absolute genius with this stuff. Any problems we, I have, I send his way. And he's one of the only people I would have ever considered doing something like this with. He's a little more tired of the big law life, and we're going to kind of come here and uh, do even more. <laughs> so I'm excited to do it. And then I, I put up a job posting that we were going to look to take on some people. And, and I'm not kidding. I got 750 resumes. So it's something that these are attorneys who have been practicing 30 years to people still in law school. Everyone just who plays games thinks this sounds fun and exciting. And it is. It's, it's very cool. So we really got our pick of the litter with that stuff. And, and I think I took on some of the best people around. And hopefully that continues to be true as we uh, continue to grow and take over the world. Wow. So do you currently have more work than you are capable of doing just because you're currently one person? Yeah, I don't like to turn away work and I like to just be up front with them. The nice – the so the, there's two nice perks of working with game dev also. One is they're nocturnal, so I can get a hold of someone at 1 a.m. if I need. I think we yeah. emailed each other at 1.30 a.m. last night. That is true. We did. And, and uh, the other side is since it's game dev, it's – you know, we're going to release this game in four months, turns into 12 months, turns into a year and a half. So things can kind of be done relaxed if they come to me in a get this prepared properly way, as opposed to the studio is on fire. I need this done in an hour. It, that second one's very rare because even if the studio is on fire, we still usually have six months to answer things like that. Uh, so it, it allows me to, to prioritize things and shuffle things around. But it's certainly gotten to the point where I, I have had to turn away some work or, or things that sounded interesting that I would have wanted to jump on, I can't do anymore. When you're going to law school, studying for the bar, getting started as a lawyer, I have to assume based on movies and everything I've heard, very busy, very difficult time in your life, did you have time for video games? Yeah, so probably more than I should have. Uh, I, <laughs> I took a hit on some bar studying hours to play some uh, video games. But then I found... So I played World of Warcraft forever, and I found that there's a, a skill in their archaeology where you have to fly for 30 minutes to get to the next thing. So I was using it as a quick five-minute break where I would fly for 30 minutes while I'm reading the stuff and study and study and study, do the five minutes of archaeology as a break, then go back to study, 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 and repeat. So it actually worked as a good timer where I don't have the attention span or, or didn't then to sit down for eight hours and, and just read the most boring nonsense in the world about tort law or criminal law, which I just don't, you know, it's not my thing anymore. And that the games actually kind of helped to, to keep me at my desk. Are there any gamer skills and I'm not just talking about knowing about video games and knowing what Steam is, but uh, just like things that you learn by being a video game player your whole life that help you be a lawyer in terms of just like strategy and thinking on your feet. And, I mean, so that's hard to pinpoint. It's such an interesting question. I don't think anyone's ever asked that, but that's it's definitely something that I I abs I give a lot of uh, praise to video games for why I consider myself quick witted and why I can kind of hang with anyone in a conversation. I, as you know, as stereotypically as video games make people antisocial, I've always played very social games. I've played the MMOs, I've played competitive uh, MOBAs and things like that, where I'm always talking to someone. And I think it builds teamwork. It, it makes you calm down when you're angry in a competitive nature. Uh, I used to have a I, I grew up playing hockey and I was very angry all the time if we were losing or if someone else tripped and I didn't screw up. So, you know, that's 10 times as bad in Dota where you pl you're stuck in that game for an hour. But I, I, it also teaches you to deal with that and that, you know, you'll play the next one. It's fine. And it teaches you to be quick thinking. So I, I can't sit here and decide for 30 minutes which option's best. You kind of just got to go with what you think is best at that moment and see what happens. Uh, it, it, there's a lot. Of, there's an endless array of benefits, I think, that came from playing that. I can also type faster than anyone. <laughs> Doing raiding without the without team speak for for a raid, you just learn to type quicker than anyone on the planet. Is there a type of case that you haven't had an opportunity to take on yet that you'd like to take on? 
Oh, that's interesting, too. I mean, so I the, the litigation side of things, everyone thinks that, you know, I'm in court every day all day and I'm not. It, yeah, making mostly, dramatic speeches, yeah, right. <laughs> certainly well, so, <laughs> revealing witnesses on the stand as I fools. I call yeah, right, exactly. But what's funny is the USPTO, which is the trademark office, which is what I deal with, they have all of that stuff. It's all akin to litigation, but it's done through their website. The, the, the trademark office is very 2016. You don't go to the courtroom anymore. There's an examiner. There's an appeal judge. There's all of that. But you do it through the website. You submit your evidence. You submit your arguments, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and, and the other attorney I was talking about earlier is more the guy in the courtroom revealing things and giving dramatic statements. So it, I, I'm excited to be part of that a little more where we, you know, when push does finally come to shove, I'm a little bit more of the shove. Has anyone ever brought to you a, a really unusual case, something that you didn't expect you'd ever be doing? Yeah, so there's uh, there's a lot of stuff. I, I certainly didn't think I'd ever be across the table from someone at Blizzard. I mean, in terms of just, I grew up playing all these games. I'm obsessed with that company, and now I have to argue against them. It's a little strange. But you also just see how how much it is the, the entertainment industry still, how much it is the, the, the Hollywood, you know, what you'd see in a movie. There is that kind of underheadedness and treachery and one guy saying he's going to sign over the IP but doesn't. It's a, It's... It's a little unreal how when you get to the upper level of this stuff, it's all the same. Money really destroys friendships and destroys relationships, and it, it makes even some good people pretty evil. Uh, we're very. I do think the game industry. I think, as you said earlier, we we grow up hating bullies and we grow up hating the bad guy. We there's very few games where you play the bad guy, and I think that is a big reason this industry is full of less, you know, full of mostly good people. But those those quote unquote bad people who see the money here, they do come in and they do screw people over. And that guy who worked ten years on and put all his blood, sweat, and tears into a game to to put out something he was really proud of, he can just lose that in a second with one bad signature and and not ever see a dollar from it. Are there any publishers out there who you see as unusually good actors who are really forces of good out there in the video game industry? Sure. So that's interesting. I think the the public perception of most publishers is pretty inaccurate i think that there's a lot of publishers were record labels for for lack of a better analogy where they were used to getting everything they wanted in a signature they were used to developers just wanting to sign things over and it's not any individual publisher's fault there's just been unfortunate publishers locked up in bad headlines with that stuff but that's just how this stuff worked i mean that was the industry you can't you can hate every record label i know probably people do nowadays but you see Game publishers, I think, a lot more respecting the industry than music labels respected music. You see Blizzard, for example, not to keep bringing them up, but I was blown away when Blizzard, Blizzard legally, I am, I wasn't at the table, but I'm very confident and I've heard some things behind the scenes. I'm very confident Blizzard could have shut down Dota and League of Legends. Both were made out of mods out of uh, Warcraft 3. And because of the EULA and the terms of service, Blizzard arguably owned everything involved there. Instead of saying, shut these games down, we're going to destroy you guys, they went to Valve and they said, change these three names in Dota and change this one character's haircut. And they did. And, and everybody was happy. And Blizzard let these things go on. They let those communities flourish. Blizzard was releasing Heroes of the Storm, which was their own version of the game. And they still didn't knock down the competition more than they had to. They didn't... I don't know. I mean, sure, of course, it's calculated with what how... PR is going to work and how Reddit and Twitter are going to react. But the fact that they can even look at that stuff and understand that stuff, I do think that makes them, even if it's unintentionally, a good actor in the industry. Uh, they, the end result is, is more happy players. And that's what's important here because games are a release for a lot of people. It really lets a lot of people get away from their, their bad lives or even just their bad day. And it, it's an escape. And when money becomes involved and these major companies are depriving thousands upon thousands of people of something they love, it's terrible. And that's the only time I call publishers terrible is when they're stealing intellectual property and shutting down a project that has a fan base. Uh, yeah, sometimes it's just due to bad contracts or bad negotiations, but I, I've, I've seen some pretty bad ones just that were outright evil. And then that company will come back the next week and do something good. So it's, it's, it's hard. Do you deal with issues of censorship and free speech? Because when you talk about App Store takedowns, one thing that's been in sort of the gaming news world this week, 
uh, is that I, I, and I actually haven't read that much about it, so um, maybe take what I'm saying with a grain of salt. But I believe Apple is not letting uh, the binding of Isaac into the App Store, has rejected the binding of Isaac for some of the imagery in that game. Are you familiar with this situation? I'm not from, I mean, I'm, I'm as familiar as you are with the, the headlines of it. I honestly yeah. haven't looked into it, too, but I can speak on censorship in, in various platforms. Yeah, uh, please, please do. So famously, Valve uh, said no to this game called Hatred, which I shouldn't even give them a shout out because it's it's just a terrible game. But there was this game where you just play a serial killer. It starts with your cliched leather jacket and your shotgun and things like that in your room. And you go outside and you, you I mean, as terrible as it is, you quite literally just murder babies and, and you know, rape mothers in front of them and things like that. It's, it's Sounds made, hilarious, dude. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's made to be as offensive as possible. Yeah. I get that. You know, whatever. I, there, there was bound to be a troll who made a video game eventually. But these guys kept saying, you know, we're, we're, we're going to make this and we're going to release it everywhere. So, fine. They tried to put it on Valve. Valve said, no way, you're not releasing this on our platform. And the internet went nuts. They said, how can you be censoring anything? You're supposed to be free speech, blah, 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 blah. Games are free speech. That's all, first off, ridiculous, because there's all, always been censorship in games. Valve, to quickly explain for those that maybe don't... I, it's hard oh, to I'm imagine sorry. you don't know this. Yeah. I, well, we've mentioned Steam a few times, but I think this is the first time you really have to understand Valve's role um, in the video game industry. And Steam... So Valve makes Steam, and Steam is basically like iTunes for PC gamers, in that it's like the primary outlet for buying PC games online. So if a game is th- is not available there, it's more... Diff- it's... I don't know. It, it it's might like, as well not be available. Yeah, it's like if an album didn't come out on <laughs> iTunes. And, like, you could still get it, but you'd be like, well, how am I supposed to get this now? Because most people use iTunes. Right, and it keeps a nice library for you so people don't like to buy games elsewhere. They like to have everything in one, one-stop one shop. So, anyway, Steam would not let this game on their platform. And is that – do you agree? I mean, just personally, is that something you uh, Well, so I actually with? wrote quite an article about this where I, I – and it's not popular. I got a lot of negative feedback for it. But I entirely agree with them. And and the reason is not for that I'm offended. I've never been offended in my life. I used to do stand-up comedy. I, I There's nothing I've ever seen that I've said, oh, that, that really shakes my knickers. It it doesn't. The, the problem here is we have legislators who are angry and looking to make headlines. We have in every country, not just America, that's throughout the world. And this was actually a British company making this game who has even crazier laws on all this stuff. But the problem is... This industry has very famously and very intelligently said, we're going to police ourselves so we don't need the government to make bad laws for us. The laws, the the legal system can't keep up with the technology here, so let us handle it. So the ESRB, the, the, uh, the ratings board in video games, they're not a government agency. They're a private group that said, we're going to do our own rating system so the government doesn't come in and do ratings for us. That's absolutely amazing. It has truly kept out I, I know personally that it has kept out legislators that would have come in otherwise so that's wonderful the, the problem with the ASRB is they have far less p- power in the app store and in, st- in on places like Steam right so, so if you want to sell your game and you cannot sell a game in GameStop Exactly. That is not rated by the ESRB. But online, who cares? Like, it's, it's a wild west. People sell you anything. <laughs> exactly. And, and, they, and they don't know how old you are, you know? Right, right. So, you know, it. so I, I think the person who made this decision at Valve was making a very smart decision where they said, we're not going to take this game because it's it's asking for someone else to come in and then police our platform. But the owner of Valve, Gabe Newell, came back and, and made a very public Shame on the person who denied this. We're going to let the game in, the, in on our store, and, and we're never going to censor a game again. Uh, I thought that was the wrong decision. I thought that was a little reactionary to the negative feedback, but fine. Uh, that is the decision they went with. Then you'll see companies like Apple who very rarely reject a game based on anything. That's why this one's so surprising because it's I, – I mean I've seen some of the other apps they've put through. I, I would imagine there's maybe some behind-the-scenes bad blood there with the popularity of Binding of Isaac. Uh, I, again, I don't know anything about it. One other blog post on your website that I really wanted to talk about uh, was you wrote about a jailbreaking exemption for video games and why that's so important for future generations of gamers. Can you explain that a little bit here? Sure. So that's actually the, – the, the author of that is my law clerk, Maida Lashani, who's absolutely wonderful. She's still a law student, and she's going to be one of the greatest game attorneys around. Uh, but what that basically boils down to is whether or not you're allowed to jailbreak, which uh, the definition of that gets annoying legally. But it's basically, can you buy your phone and then screw around with your phone and do whatever you want with it? Or do you owe Apple some kind of loyalty with your iPhone where you can't, you can't change the software on it? You can't change the, uh, the behind the scenes on it? And it, it, it also goes all the way 
where this stuff goes legally to let's say a game dies, let's say EverQuest goes offline and you want to run your own private EverQuest server, at what point are you at what point do they lose claim to owning how people play with the stuff that they already own? And has, is, that's not a hypothetical, right? Like, there's real world. What's a real world example where that has come up? And yeah, you know, I mean, jailbreaking so that, has been uh, kind of the crux of the issue. Yeah, I mean, emulators, for example, are, are where this all probably stemmed from. So emulators are famously where you would have a fake console on your on your computer and play with the games. The, it, it all it's so hard to pinpoint one area in this, uh, and I, I urge you to go read Midas blog post if, if you're interested. It's it's hard to pinpoint one area in this because. It's it's we we are run by EULAs, which are the the ninety page document you don't read but you click OK to that say so much about what you can and can't do with the stuff you're paying for, and the number one thing it always says is you don't own it. So any ebook you've ever bought for your Kindle or any app you've ever bought for your iPhone, you don't own those. You only paid for a license to download them. That company still owns everything involved with it. Uh, if you spend ten thousand dollars in the app and you get all these magic coins to unlock levels, and you spend all this stuff, and blah, 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 but then an hour after you, you spend all that money, you do something wrong, and they ban you, that sucks. You don't get your money back. They don't owe you anything. They're allowed to do that. You didn't buy that those coins. You don't get to say, hey, you can't ban me. I have these coins. You only bought a license to play with them until they say you can't anymore, and if that happens an hour after, that sucks. That's, that's the end of that. So it, it's an industry completely run by that, and it gets a little trickier with hardware. Can I, can I mess around with my iPhone hardware? No or yes, or maybe it's an obvious yes. Fine, but then what about the actual iOS system? That's software. When I sign up on your iOS and when I connect to the App Store and everything else, I agree to a lot of things. I think Apple's is 164 pages right now. And when you don't listen to that and you change your iOS system and you change the back end on your phone, you're breaching all of those agreements. And it, it's going to become a very big question as to whether or not that's okay. Uh, and, and, you know, as you'll see in the article, it's, it's now it's leaning towards OK, but, I, I, you know, they're not going to go quietly into the night by any means. You mentioned like virtual goods and who owns them there. I have to there's presumably no laws around that. Right. Like any laws we have about that, we're extrapolating other laws that weren't written explicitly for virtual goods. Right. Well, so there's actually there's no laws, but there's a lot of case law. Uh, and, and a lot is not true either, but there's some I, both. I'm sorry. There is law and there is uh, case law. The, the game that blew everyone away with what is okay virtual property wise is surprisingly enough second life so in every that's not third, surprising i feel like second life very precedent setting in a lot of ways it is but the the people so remember that as a uh, uh, you know sex simulator gone defunct but that's not what it was it was a very popular game where people and it still is where people sell clothes and have different meetups and things like that it was revolutionary in a million different ways and one such way was was the virtual property and actually selling ownership to them so they would sell plots of land in this online game for tens of thousands of dollars, and, and that's real money. And this guy figured out a way to uh, hack the system and get these properties for five cents. Or uh, apologies, he didn't do anything technically wrong. It wasn't a hack. He exploited a bug, and he got these uh, these properties that were supposed to be auctioned for tens of thousands. He got for a few cents, and it became a very big question of, it, does this work like real land? Did he just win an auction and even if the auctioneer screwed up did he still win it and he has to be honored and it, it that was the first case i'm aware of where it was is virtual property property and the court said yeah it is so there is did he get precedent. to keep it yeah there, there's precedent there where this stuff is yours the problem is the, the game industry basically said oh okay then we're just going to add a clause in that document no one reads and say you don't own any of this and that will hold up in court so as great a case as that was for gamers, we now have the flip side where I don't think there's any any game out right now where you actually buy anything in. So it, it's it's it, they've they've reworked it to figure it out. You know, World of Warcraft. Going back to that is is where all the other stuff started. Do you own your character? Can you go on eBay and sell your character? The answer is no. Uh, Blizzard owns that character. The counter argument is if I buy a Fender guitar and I write a great song on it, does Fender own that song? No, of course not. So why does Blizzard get to own this character that I created and, and grew, even though they gave me the platform to do it in? 
I guess my question then is, do we need new laws? Do we need new laws written by someone who knows what country Final Fantasy IV came from? Um, <laughs> my, for, my, for, to, you know, just because there the, things have changed so much. And, like, there is the, like, I don't know, the there's so many things now that couldn't have been imagined when these, these current laws were initially written. Is, is the law equipped to deal with these things? Yeah, I mean, so I, I'm actually... Uh, and I swear I'm not trying to plug on your show, but I'm doing a podcast also where we talk about this stuff where the law meets technology. And basically what that means is in five years, we're going to have borderline self-aware AI. If you saw some of the stuff my clients are working on, it's absolutely insane. And the problem is, at what point does AI get rights? At what point are you not liable for what your AI oh, does? Oh, I just want to own, like, my plus two broadsword in World of Warcraft. Yeah, right. You're going to, like, uh, do androids dream of, like, sh- sheep yeah, territory here. Yes, I mean, does, an, does it, your your sex robot have to consent to sex after it gains self-awareness? Are we just breeding another industry to reject us? You know, it's, it's, uh, it, it's, so we're dealing with World of Warcraft right now, but that's, it's, it's almost short sighted to act like, oh, okay, we'll figure this out and then we're fine. I think the only oh, answer see. to all of this is to create a separate Supreme Court made up of tech guys and scientists or computer scientists who really understand this stuff, who are legally background, so they are judges, but just an entirely separate court that only deals with tech issues. And make that the equivalent to the Supreme Court, but for technology. I'm, I'm not pulling that out of thin air. There's a lot of very respected academics in the legal society who think that needs to happen with how society is going. But there's absolutely no movement politically on it, of course. Uh, outside of that, I can't imagine. Our Congress can't figure out, you know, what did they just spend three months arguing a couple months ago? What's the state bird of their of Arkansas? They just, nothing's going to get done that way. So right, right. Th- th- this needs a different approach. Otherwise, we're going to see technology kind of take over the law, which no one wants to see happen. When, when Apple can sit there and say, we're going to do things this way, try to stop us politicians, it gets dangerous. I have to ask, you know, stick with me here for a second. You know that scene in Roger Rabbit where uh, Judge Doom is walking around and he's, <laughs> Roger's hiding in the back of the bar and to get Roger out, he's doing, he's doing the shave and a haircut and like Roger like can't contain himself and he's like shaking because he can't contain himself from from bursting out and yelling two bits that I have felt like that this entire conversation dying to bring up at every time we say the words video game lawyer to bring up Phoenix Wright I'm, I'm just it's I'm fighting everything within my body to, to make a Phoenix Wright joke every time we say the words video game lawyer Phoenix Wright is a video game he is a he is a character in a video game who is a lawyer as opposed to a real life person who is a lawyer deals with video games like yourself um but surely you deal with phoenix Wright references all the time every day so i guess first question he's also like the only video game lawyer as far as as far as i know like you know i don't think there's it's not like tv where there's a lot of video game lawyers it's funny that that my Lashani law clerk i was just telling you about she actually just made uh the D &D table of of alignments for fictional lawyers Oh, but not but but not video game lawyers because no, I, there's uh I, yeah no, I believe there's only one or two uh, actual video game lawyers. Well, that's because uh, the law seems difficult to adapt to video games. Wait, who are the others? No, actually, I'm looking at it now, and it, Phoenix Wright, yeah, is the only lawyer series. I guess that's true. I was thinking of Metalocalypse, their attorney. <laughs> um, so how I've never played the Phoenix Wright games. Are they good? Do you like them? They're very they're the furthest thing away from how the law works, but they're very fun. I do like them. It, it's it's uh. It's a silly game. It, 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 there, there are some challenging levels, but at the end of the day, it's almost ridiculous how much you would have to look at a guide to do it well. Or, or I've only played one or two myself, so I don't want to speak to the whole series. But you know, it's a fun, silly thing, and uh, it's very popular. Though certainly, every time I say video game lawyer, that's what comes up, and I have him quoted on my website. You know, it's it's because uh, he very famously is the guy sticking up for the little guy who can't defend people who who. He wants to defend people who can't normally afford to defend themselves or don't know how. And I really try to model my stuff after that mentality, even if it's not necessarily based on Phoenix Wright. It's nice that he kind of encompasses that also. Uh, people always yell at me that I'm just doing this for marketing or whatever. And even if I was, I don't think that's such a bad thing. But I truly am not. It's what you said earlier. I just really don't like bullies. I don't like people harassing people who can't defend themselves. And that's what's cool that Phoenix Wright is that also. So I get pictures all the time of, uh, you know, Objection, which is his famous thing in the game. And uh, just every AMA I do, someone will say, hey, are you Phoenix Wright? So it's it's uh, it's something that's going to be with me forever. Yeah, <laughs> it's not so bad. There could, there could be worse things. Oh, absolutely. Are there any games that 
capture what makes it interesting to be a lawyer? Any games that do? Not really. I mean, well, the fun... So, Phoenix Wright is not how the law works. It's not really how a court works. But it is kind of true to the fact that attorneys do a lot more than you would think in terms of being a private investigator or figuring out the back end of stuff or really researching and seeing how all the puzzle pieces fit. And the game does capture that very well, where he'll actually go put the pieces together himself. He doesn't sit there and just look up case law for three hours, which is not what this is. I mean, that's it, at the end of the day, you really need to use all that and put it together and understand why you're right or understand how your client could possibly be right. And it, it captures the excitement of that pretty well. You know, you're running this law firm. Uh, you're doing great. You got potentially more work than you can handle. Do you still find time for video games? Yeah, I do. I act- it's nice because I actually play games with my clients. So, the uh, you know, I have guys <laughs> I play Heroes of the Storm with almost too much. Uh, I stopped playing Dota because Dota is an hour commitment every time minimum, and, and Heroes is more like 20 minutes. Uh, and, and I do need to be at the beck and call of clients on the other way. But yeah, I still I still find time to game. I'm also on planes a lot, so I, I try to play my client stuff on on uh, my phone during that. But I'll never stop playing games. Yeah, it seems like you'd be bad at your job if you did. Exactly. <laughs> well, well, Ryan, thank you for one explaining all this today. Two, all this great work you've done for uh, game developers in the video game community. Um, but how can you? Ma- you know, you're you mentioned plugging it. You're allowed to plug things on the show. That's the point of coming <laughs> on the podcast. Uh, what is the name of that podcast? What is your website? How can people get more in touch with your work? Sure. So the podcast hasn't actually launched yet, but it's called Robot Congress, and it's going to be about how law and technology meet in the future. Where where we're not always going to be talking about such heavy things as you know, do Android sleep, but we're going to be just talking about issues every week where these things don't. Where some something in the law doesn't meet with something in technology, and we do, is it as bad as it seems? So it'll it, it'll be fun. It's coming out on a network I think some of you might have heard of, and we'll and we'll figure it out from there. Uh, the other stuff, uh, follow me on Twitter. It's Mr. Ryan Morrison because every other iteration of Ryan Morrison was taken. Or just Google Video Game Attorney, and you'll see some of my AMAs and be able to follow along and come ask a question. Awesome. Ryan, thank you so much for, I guess, watching my stuff for years, but also uh, coming on the show, but mostly for coming on the show this afternoon, talking about it. No problem, man. Enjoy your day, and uh, we'll, we'll be in touch. All right, everybody. Thank you, as always, for listening to my podcast, The Jeff Rubin, Jeff Rubin Show. One thing I wanted to plug here uh, in our brief time together at the end of the show is, remember Eric Stifler? We interviewed him uh, in the fall of, let's say, 2014? Is it that long ago already? Maybe it was the fall of 2015? No, it was the fall of 2014. Uh, Eric ran Nyctophobia, uh, one of the premier haunted house experiences in the nation, and now he has taken some of that experience and started Pity Applause, which is uh, this kind of immersive improv experience. They're doing shows in New York, and they've got videos up at pityapplause.com, and I would encourage you uh, to listen to that episode and then go check out pityapplause.com. Me? I'm still cranking out podcasts. Two weeks from now, we are going to be talking uh, to one of the founders of Reductress.com. Reductress.com, a very funny website. Uh, You know what? Maybe I won't tell you what it's about. Maybe I'll just leave it for you to go explore for the next two weeks uh, because next time we talk, uh, it's going to be with the founder of that website. I will see you there. You'll be the first to hear about it. If you follow me uh, on Twitter, Ryan Matt Jeff Rubin Show, you know the drill. Thank you, as always. Uh, Two weeks, Reductress episode. Looking forward to it. See you there.